like to say good morning to each one this morning. It is warm in here, but cold outside. Y'all know that. Uh, anyway, we're glad each one uh, came out this morning, braved the cold weather to come out to Sunday school this morning. Actually, we had uh, five more in Sunday school this morning. We had last Sunday. So we had 36 in Sunday school this morning, and our offering uh, was $846, and we had 90 one in uh, worship service last Sunday. So we're thankful for this. If you're here visiting with us, we certainly uh, want you to join in a worship service. And got a lot going on today. So anyway, you want to get your hymn book and turn number 362. Number 362. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all along. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arm. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. Number 154, number 154. <clears throat> more about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness. See, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus. Let me learn. More of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness. See, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus on his throne. Riches and glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase. More of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see. More of his love who died for me. <clears throat> now number 121. Number 121. <laughs> Bless. 
Blessed be the fountain of blood to a world of sinners revealed. Blessed be the dear Son of God, only by His stripes we are healed. Though I've wandered far from His fold, bring to my heart pain and woe. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than the snow. Whiter than the snow. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb, and I shall be whiter than snow. Thorny was the crown that he wore, and the cross his body or cave. Grievous were the sorrows he bore, but he suffered thus not in vain. May I to that fountain be led, may to cleanse my sins he be Wash me in the blood that he shed, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than the snow. Whiter than the snow. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb, and I shall be whiter than snow. Father, I have wandered from thee, often has my heart gone astray. Crimson do my sins seem to be, and I cannot wash them away. Jesus, to that fountain of thine, leaning on that promise I go. Cleanse me by thy washing divine, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than the snow, whiter than the snow. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb, and I shall be whiter than snow.
All right, we're going to do something a little bit, uh, a little bit different this morning. Uh, Ms. Shannon, Ms. Eating, I don't have y'all's degree. If I did, I'd be giving it to you right now. But I want you guys to know, and I want you guys to look well at these two. Uh, these are two that uh, started three years ago through a journey and through Faith Bible Institute, and they have completed their Bible degree through Faith Bible Institute. That's a three-year commitment, and I want y'all to give them a round of applause. And this meal that we're having, this potluck that we're having is really in their honor, so we want you to come around, hug their neck, let them know that you love them and that you're proud of them, okay? So that's all I got for you guys. Y'all are awesome. <clears throat> Boy, that makes a pastor's heart swell with pride. All right, I'm going to ask you at this time, if you would stand, we're going to ask our ushers to come and make their way forward. As they're coming, a couple of announcements. Um, uh, we, um, sorry, my mind went blank. Miss Mary, uh, Marietta Henderson, her funeral uh, and visitations at two o'clock. The two o'clock's visitation over here at Turpin. The funeral will be at three. Um, those y'all know, uh, many of the family are here. Uh, y'all go and and uh, show your love, your support, and your prayers uh, for this family. I'm gonna ask this time, Brother Bruce, would you lead our hearts in a word of prayer, please? Amen. You may be seated. Amen. But go, uh, go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles, Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. This morning, I, I want to convey something of great importance, of, of great consequence. We've been going through the book of Luke, as many of you know, and Jesus, as he is going to the cross, he, is, um, he doesn't mince words. He doesn't pull any punches. He is going to tell you exactly what he means. You don't have to ask well, Jesus, tell us what you really think, you know. It was very plain. He very plainly speaks forth. Uh, some of the hardest sayings are from that time where he set his face like a flint towards Jerusalem to give his life a sacrifice as a, um, as a substitution for our sins. He dies on the cross for our sins. He was buried. He, ra- ra- uh, he rose from the dead. But there is a... There is a He's not, he's not, not he's, I want you to understand when we look at these hard sayings, he's not being unloving. He's just, do, he does what love does. He tells the truth. And he tells you in, in the most simplest way he can in describing this to you. But 
what we're going to talk about this morning is the, the cost of discipleship, the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, do you know what a disciple is? Could you point one out if you've seen one? Are you a disciple? Uh, when we look at the word disciple, it's a. It, it, we also use the word kind of like it. It's the word discipline. But the word disciple itself means learner. Someone who is learning or is, uh, is studying under their master. And Jesus Christ is that master. I'm not the, I'm not the uh, master you're trying to learn under. Even though I'm here and I preach to you uh, God's word. It's not my word, it's God's word. And so you are therefore learning and under the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. A disciple is someone who learns from their teacher. But I want you to see that discipleship has a very high cost. Now, salvation itself is free. All right, It's not of yourself. It is the gift of God. But discipleship has a price tag put on it. It's not cheap. And isn't it true the things that are worth having cost a great deal? The things that are worth having cost great amount of time, energy, resource, the things that are worth having. And discipleship, if it were free, think about it. If discipleship, this discipline of learning Christ's teaching, if it were free, would you regard it the same way? You wouldn't. Let me give you an example of why. All right, if you had a math problem and someone just gave you the answer to it, you would have no regard at all for the, the, the struggle it took to come up with the answer. But when you've struggled and you come to the answer yourself, there's a sense of pride and appreciation for the coming to the answer. And Christ is the same way. He doesn't, he can't just zap you with a ray of sunshine and all of a sudden you're just a disciple, just like that, okay? It doesn't happen that way. No one is an instant baked disciple, okay? It's not minute rice, okay? You don't just stick it in the microwave and boom, it's done. This is something that takes great amount of time. None of us have arrived in this, and this is something that has a great price tag attached to it. Now, if you were wanting to be Jesus' disciple this morning, then know it comes again with a high cost. And these are the, I want you to see that there are no discounts. Then you go look for good deals at this time, right? There are no discounts. There are no shortcuts. And Jesus here in Matthew's gospel, or Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, look with me in verse 25. He begins, and it says, And there were great multitudes with him. And he turned and he said unto them, If any man, if any man come to me and hate not his father, his mother, his wife, children, brethren, sister, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tire sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man, he began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king? Going to make war against another king, sits not down first and consults whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000. Or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an ambassador or an ambassador, or an ambassador and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsakes not all that he has, he says it the third time, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is there it is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. And he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray together. Now, Father, I pray, Lord, for these people that I've prayed for all week. The Holy Spirit, your word would drive itself so deep in our hearts that it would shake and unearth and, unmo and move us to the, to the point that we would have a resolve, a resolution that says, I want to be a disciple of the Lord to Jesus Christ at any cost. And Lord, I pray that we walk away with that resolve that you birthed in us, that you put that seed 
in us and that we walk out of here different than the way we came in. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So I want you to see, look at that very first thing in verse 26. If any man, he comes after me, and he hates not his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brethren, his sisters, yea, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus, you can't accuse Jesus of saying, if you want to be my disciple, and you get a contract, and there's a lot of fine print at the bottom of the contract. Okay, you can't accuse Jesus of that. He tells you point blank what the cost is going to be. Now, he says here, the word hate, and many people say, does that mean like a scornful, vengeful hatred? He's not saying that at all because that would be in contradiction of honor your father and mother. What he is saying here is, is that he's using the word hate in the sense of a contrast. You see it before in other scriptures. Uh, no man can serve two masters, for he will either love one and hate the other. Not to say that he hates the other master, but he'll have a preference to one. And Christ is to be the preference. He is to be the preference. You are to prefer him over your father, your mother, your brothers, your sisters. He is to be the preeminence. He is the focal point. You know, uh, let, me, let me help you to understand this. Uh, tomorrow, um, I'll be celebrating my 14th anniversary. And my wife is number two in my life. And she doesn't mind being number two. I'm number two in her life. You say, well, what do you mean? I love the Lord Jesus Christ far more. And because I love him first, I can now adequately and love her far more, get this, far more than if I had loved her as first. You will not love your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, and all those people. You will not love them the way you ought to until you have first loved him. First, foremost. He desires to be the preeminence. And if you're going to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first cost, the first price tag, I want you to see it, is that you must worship Him at all costs. Even if it's at the expense of the people that you love and hold dear. He will not play second fiddle to anyone. He is to be number one. He is to be the preeminent. He is to be first. And that's why, I have, if you have taken notes, I know we, our printer's out, so you forgive me for not having your notes, but if you want to write them on the back of your, um, uh, your bulletin, you're welcome to. A disciple must worship at any cost. He must worship at any cost. Look at there in verse 26 again. He says, If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brother, and sister, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The cost of following Jesus is that, is that uh, it must come before every personal relationship. Your mother, your father, all that. But I want you to see the next thing here is that uh, you are to love him more than you would even love your own self. So let me give you, let me, you say, well, where do you see that? See, you see the very first thing here is that we are to love him above every personal relationship. But the second thing I want you to see in this is that we should love him more than our own personal reputation. Where you, say, where you see that? Taking up your cross and to following him is this. You don't have a reputation. <laughs> you don't have a reputation to hold. And, you know, we wear jewelry, you know, crosses, and there's nothing, I don't believe anything wrong with that, okay? But the, I want you to understand when it says to pay, take up your cross, to take up your, your uh, instrument of death by which you will be crucified, you have no, I mean, it was, a, it was an object of shame. It was, an, it was a picture of suffering. So when he says, and, unless you take up your cross, take up the shame, the reproach, you cannot be my disciple. And if you can't bear the reproach, and if you can't bear the shame, and if you can't bear the suffering of it, you just need to go ahead and put it down. He's saying you don't have what it takes. And I pray here that everyone here has what it takes, because I believe the Spirit of God enables every one of us to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we, if we are wanting it, he says that this is what it's going to cost. And you say, uh, it's a matter of the will. I want you to understand, nobody says, this is my cross to bear. 
Okay? No one is forced to be a disciple. No one has to take up or is, is thrust upon them. They take it up. It's a matter of your own personal free will. You must take it up of your own free will. How do I know that? Because Jesus says, no man takes my life. No one's making me do this. I lay it down freely, willingly. And no one's going to make you be a disciple. No one's going to make you be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's something that you do, and it's a part of your own personal will. I like what A.W. Tozer said. He was asked the question of, what does, what does it mean to, uh, to take up your cross? He said, first thing, he said, a man who is crucified is only facing one way. Boy, isn't that good? He's only facing one way. Second thing, a man who is cru- crucified, he's not going back. He's already said his goodbyes. And look at number three, he says, He has no further plans of his own. If you're going to be a disciple, you have to worship him at any cost. But look at the next thing here. You must work at any cost. You must work at any cost. Look at verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Now, when Jesus here, he mentions the tower, he's talking about the fruitfulness, the fruitfulness of a Christian life. A tower was built in a vineyard for the protection of the fruit that it was to produce. And he's saying, (coughs) if if we are going to build, I I want you to see that, first of all, we think about being a disciple, we think of the crucifixion, but now he's saying, I want to construct something. I want to build you into the man woman of God that you ought to be. He has a plan for your life. He has a blueprint for your life. And you say, what is it? That you be made in the very image of Jesus Christ. That's the blueprint, if you want to know. And and he's saying, you need to sit down and count the cost. Not not whether or not you have the means to do it. I've always taken that to mean, well, if it costs $500 to build this tire, I only got two fifty. dollars That's not what it's saying. He's saying that it's going to cost you everything. You see that in the verse 28, or verse, uh, verse, uh, sorry, 32, I believe. He says, he that not gives up all that he has, everything, he cannot be my disciple. It's going to cost you everything. And you don't want to get in the middle of building this thing and say, oh, well, I don't know if I can finish this because I I got this obligation, I've got this responsibility, I got this, 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 and this. He's saying it costs you everything. To be built in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, you reserve nothing for yourself. If you were a poker player, you're all in on Jesus. He must work at any cost. Work at any cost. He has a blueprint. He is going to build you into the image of His Son. If you're going to be a disciple, count the cost. It's not cheap. There isn't a cheap way, there's not a discount, there's not an easy way, there's not a lazy way, there's, not, there's only one way. You know, and I, you know what's wrong with many of churches today? Many of churches have half built towers. They began to build, they started out really fervently and passionately for the Lord Jesus Christ, but something happened. And they left off building. And people today, isn't it true? People today laugh and mock at Christianity today. Why? Because there's a bunch of half-built towers. They began to build. But look where they are now today. And it becomes a matter of a joke. Paul, uh, people who used to be faithful, used to tithe, used to be prayer warriors, used to be students of the Word of God. And then let me just say this too. The new year is about to start. Some of you have resolved within yourself you're going to read the Bible all the way through. Don't stop at the book of Leviticus. That's not where it ends, okay? That's where a lot of people's Bible reading ends. But can I say this too? If you're going to have the resolve, okay? If you're going to have the resolve, don't put in mind a goal. What do I mean? Don't say, okay, for example, I want to lose 10 pounds. Don't do that. Because one of two things are going to happen. One, you'll either do it 
and then you'll leave off doing it, uh, doing the exercise necessary to maintain it because you lost it, right? Or number two, you won't, uh, you won't accomplish it, and you'll be discouraged in it. Can I tell you a better resolution? I want to be a healthy person. I want to be someone who's healthy. Uh, that is, I want to have a lifestyle that maintains a healthy lifestyle. Okay, so if you're going to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you say, I am going to read my Bible in one year. That's a very, hey, I, I'm not diminishing that. That's a great goal to have. But why not be, I'm going to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ at all costs. That way, let me give you the, that way, so when you stumble, you fall, you mess up, you say, well, I tried. There's a difference. There's a difference. Because if you're saying, I'm going to be a disciple, he says, I, Though a righteous man falls seven times, what does he do afterward? He gets back up. I'm not a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and and, and, and the perfect nature of it. I want you to understand, I'm not perfect by any measure of imagination. I'm just good at getting back up. That's what a disciple does. He gets back up again. Look Look here again, is that I want you to see he worships at any cost. He um. He will work at any cost. But then I want you to see the third thing. He will war at any cost. Look at verse 31. It says, What king going to make war against another king sits down not first and consults whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is a great way off, he sends an ambassador or ambassage and desires conditions of peace. There is a war that you enter into when you become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you not understand? There is someone out, there's, a, there's someone called Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him. He is out to steal, kill, and destroy you, and he will seek at whatever means to do so. You have entered into a war, and there are no neutral parties. There are no, there's no one say that say, I'm neutral in this. And if you're going to be a disciple, look at the odds that Jesus says. He says, as for the odds concerning this, Jesus tells us that if we follow him, we follow him into war, and we are outnumbered two to one. It's, he says it's like 10,000 going against 20,000. But if God be for us, who could stand against us? Disciples are warriors and not cowards. They don't look at the numbers and say, we can't do it. Yes, you can. You can be a disciple. You can fight this war. Disciples are warriors, not cowards. And are you willing to go into the battle? Are you prepared to enter into the fray? And many a Christian want to go through this world where there is no conflict. Okay, can I tell you, there's no safe space big enough for that. You want to go through this world without conflict, without criticism, without being scarred. Let me tell you, a a disciple has already said, I am going to fight no matter what the odds. There are many businessmen who will not stand up against selling alcohol, selling lottery tickets. There are many people who are afraid to witness in their workplace because they're afraid that they'll lose their jobs. Now, just say this with me. I want you to repeat this with me. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Say it with me. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Say it again. The righteous are as bold as a lion. If you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't shrink back from the battle or the conflict that, that lies before you. You engage at any cost. Jesus says if you don't, If you don't have the will to fight and the battle becomes imminent, you will send an ambassador to try to make peace with the enemy. Now, who's the enemy? Satan's the enemy. Do you think you can negotiate with the devil? Because that's what you do. Do you become a disciple? If you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to, you have to, you have. If you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have become a threat to to Satan's kingdom. And he will, he doesn't have to beat you. He knows he can't stand against you. Okay, you just don't know that. I don't understand that. He knows he can't stand against you. 
But he, he knows that if I can get him to compromise, if I can get him to shirk back from the fray, I will win the day. And that's what I want you to understand. If you're going to be a disciple, you must war at any cost. When you enter the fight, it's all or nothing. That's why Jesus said in verse 33, he said, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. If you build the tower, it's all or nothing. If you're going to enter into this war, it's all or nothing. He doesn't want something. Can I tell you that? He doesn't want something. And he, don't, he doesn't just want anything. He wants everything. He doesn't want just a part of your life. He desires it all. I like what Adrian Rogers says about when we, when we compromise. It's like a man who went bear hunting. Miss Phyllis, you'll love this, right? A man went bear hunting. And he goes and he sees a bear and he gets that gun out and he's about, to, he's about to shoot this bear. And he has that finger on the trigger and he's ready to pull it. And the bear says, whoa, 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 whoa. Stop right there. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. He says, why are you hunting? And he says, well, I want a fur coat. He says, okay. Do you, have you considered why I'm out here? He says, no, I haven't. Why are you out here? He says, well, I'm looking for a good meal. Can we talk about this? He says, sure, sure, let's talk about it. So they talk about it, and the, and the bear gets a warm meal, and the man gets a fur coat. Some of you all get it in a minute. But I want you to see that that's, what, that's exactly what Satan does. When we compromise, we, 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 uh, we end up like the hunter wearing a bear coat from the inside of the bear. <clears throat> The churches in America today are not filled with warriors anymore. It doesn't seem, does it? This is not a garrison of great warriors anymore. It's a place where we cower and we, and we shrink back from the world because we say how bad and terrible it is instead of entering into that fight. But I want you to see the last thing a disciple is. He will witness at any cost. He will witness at any cost. Look at there in verse 34. He says, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? There's a crucifixion that he calls us to. There's a construction he calls us to. There's a conflict. But I want you to see lastly that there is a, com there is a commission. When Jesus speaks about salt, it's always in reference to our witness and our testimony. Salt preserves. Our country has been in a moral decline for some time, and the, rotten that has, the rotting that has occurred has been for a lack of preservatives, a lack of witnesses. Salt is also an antiseptic. You know, in the world we live in, it's very sick, but applied, it can have healing properties. And I want you to see also, salt also burns. It's an irritant. If you have not irritated somebody with your faith, you are not doing it right. Okay, it's going to irritate. The world at large does not like to hear the gospel, does not want to hear the gospel. In fact, we'll find it irritating. Just drop the name of Jesus in any public setting, and everyone will go, oh. it happens. Why? Because salt, it can irritate. It brings forth uh, healing. But did you know, have you ever wondered why? In this passage here, I wish I had the other verse up there, but I'll, I'll, co I'll come back to it later. He says, if salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing. In fact, I think Matthew's gospel, it says, it's cast out on the road and men trodden it under its foot. Have you ever wondered why it's been open season on Christianity? Why on sitcoms, the butt of every joke is the Christian, as being ignorant, as being uh, over-religious and impractical? You know why it's been open season? It's because the salt has lost its savor. And if we're being, if, aren't you getting tired of being walked on? That's why, that's why, because we have failed to be the witnesses we should be. It is open season on Christianity because they don't see the gospel. They're not hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They just see a bunch of religious nuts and fruitcakes, and they laugh at it. And it's of no good, and so we have been trodden underfoot. Aren't you tired of that? Aren't you ready to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ to rise up and say, at any cost I'm going to witness because his name is not going to be put under the foot of men, but with high regard. 
And the only way that happens is if we don't curtail our duty of being a witness at any cost. I want to close with this. Say, Brother Heath, are you a pra- do you practice what you preach? I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a price I will not pay. And if I fall and I, and I fail, if I don't make my Bible in one year pledge, or if I don't pray like I should for, for you guys every day that I should, though I stumble and though I fall, I'm going to get back up. By the grace of God that he's given me, I'm going to get back up. It may take me a while. I might get knocked down. I might stay there for a second. But I will get back up again. And that's the resolve that a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ has, is that I don't care how far I get knocked down, I'm going to get back up. I'm going to get back up. And I want to say this as we prepare for our invitation. Jesus said here, in that last verse, he said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. What is he saying is that some people don't have the ears to hear what he had to say. They weren't prepared to pay that cost. They weren't ready to, to, to pay what it was going to cost to follow him. Not everybody here today, I believe, will adhere to it. You don't have the ears to hear it. I pray that you do. I pray the Spirit of God would speak to you. But ultimately, remember, if you're going to take up that cross, it's a matter of your own free will, and it's going to cost you everything. And so can I ask you, have you counted the cost? I I pray that your resolution for this year is simply that I will be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And though I fall, and though I fail, I'll get back up again. It's going to cost you everything. If... If you're serious about being a disciple of Jesus Christ, can I give you an action step? Remember, a disciple is a learner. If you're serious about it, I'll see you in Sunday school next week. If you're serious about it, I'll see you in Sunday school. Amen? Right? I get some of them. I will see you in Sunday school because you want to learn at any cost. You know, the desire for every disciple, right, is to bring honor and glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's only one place that says that all glory to God to be given is where? Church. You cannot give glory to God. I don't, you think you can be a free agent disciple? That's not how this works. It's in the context of the church that you have the fellowship of believers that we can encourage you that we can exhort you, that we can keep you accountable. Hey, what does also the Scripture say? If a man falls and he has no one to pick him up, woe to him that falls because he has no one to pick him up. But if he has a fellow, if he has someone there with him, he can help him up again. And I can't tell you how many times I've been helped up and I have helped up. Does that make sense? I've been helped up and encouraged by by the believers of this church. And you cannot walk this Christian life, this discipleship thing. It's not, it's not a maverick thing. It is something that we do together. Maybe you need to join this church. Maybe you haven't even started the journey. Hey, uh, discipleship, it costs. But understand, salvation is made free to you today. But if you died today, do you know where you would go? Can I, can I exhort you in this? The law says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. We've all told lies and we've all stolen. So from one liar to another, from one thief to another, can I tell you how I found forgiveness? When Jesus Christ came, He lived a sinless life. He never lied. He never stole. He never did anything wrong. And the Bible says He was my substitute. The wages of the sins that I committed was death, and it deserved the very wrath of God, but the wrath of God fell on him instead of me. And if I and he was buried, he rose again, and then that one day when I was a young teenager, he came to me and says, I will forgive all your sin if you'll believe on me for what I've done for you. That I that sacrifice was sufficient in purchasing you forgiveness of sin. And that same forgiveness that I have been offered. 
and I received, he offers to you. No one's getting to heaven by a different way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And the scripture says very plainly that if you'll call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Do you believe, lost person, do you believe that if you called on the name of the Lord that he would save you? Do you believe that? No matter how bad your sin is, I, I was witnessing to a guy uh, on Facebook the other day, and he says, what if I committed murder? I said, it doesn't matter. He died for the worst of us. He died, he, and you say, well, that doesn't sound fair. Listen, that's the beauty of grace. It makes life not fair. Because fair is all of us going to hell. Grace is us getting at what we don't deserve, and that's forgiveness of sin. If you'll call on His name, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. That is a promise of God. And if you'll believe that here this morning, we want to give you the opportunity to respond in this invitation. This invitation also, hey, I don't know what it is. I can't, I can't quantify it. But whenever we step out, isn't it true? There's a sealing of the deal. If you are here today and you are saying, Lord, help me be a disciple, I will do it at any cost. There's something to be said about bringing it to the altar. There's nothing real spiritual about it. I don't know what it is. It's just something that says, I'm committed to do this very thing. And if you're here today and you're lost, don't walk out of here not knowing what would happen to you if you died. That's what this invitation is for. Would you stand?